Yes. Yes. So, so I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of the latest stuff I've been doing, which is a uh, deep generative modeling of neonatal cortical surfaces. So for me, the start is like, why do you care about this? So the whole point is neural development um, is really complex and sensitive. So it's, it's just so much stuff is happening. So anything that just I'm well, being medical, I just have to say atypical development, but in a sort of hand wavy way, anything that disrupts that process or means that it's in any way altered can it can result in cognitive disorders like ADHD, autism spectral disorders. Um, but we don't really understand how. Like we we understand almost like like very little on how this happens. Um, but we know that there is a correlation there. And clinically, what's the use in modeling if 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 you know if I went to Professor Edwards, who's my second supervisor, and I told him you can wave a magic wand and have a model that does whatever you want, he would desire, he would want a, a model that can explain how these morphological changes that we see, that we can see in imaging, for example, correlate to clinical outcomes. So how does it correlate to having uh you know having an increased risk of uh autism spectral disorder for example um and better yet can we identify which subjects are in need of clinical intervention and when and you know why and how and you know and so on and so forth so clinically there is a motivation here in understanding this process and Studying on the surface is a pretty efficient way of studying the cortex, one of which is that the human cortex is a surface. It's a folded sausage. So that's kind of the native way of understanding it. But it's also efficient in terms of, hey, the surface is a lot smaller and more compact uh, a representation than the whole 3D. Um, and we know that it contains at least the information, it seems to contain everything that we need. So we can make predictions as good as uh, on, on certain phenotypes, as good as if we had the full 3D scan. So what is cortical neural development? So there are a lot of changes that happen. So um, folding changes between, so we'll talk about between 28 and 44 weeks post-menstrual age. Um, so much change happens even after birth. Um, Microstructurally, this sort of big diagram shows the changes in myelination. So red is increased myelin, and we can see it follows certain patterns and certain um, uh, uh, sort of identifying features that we can understand. This is like a very um, highly specific process, shall we say. You know, it's not a random growth. There's a very specific way in which um, the cortex develops. Um, so, why, what, what, what is hard about, what, what is the problem with modeling this? The biggest problem is that the subject variation is huge. Even at 28 weeks, your folding pattern that you're going to have is very clearly different from another subject, just, just like that, just normal variation. Plus, we also have a complication that there is Post-menstrual age scan, so when we look at in an image, when we look at a snapshot of a point in time of a, a, a developing brain, there's a post-menstrual age at the point at which we scanned it, and there's gestational age at birth, which is a little bit confusing. So here's a nice sort of diagram. If you think of, um, they measure it from the last period to the gestational age at birth compared to when you actually scan and these are interdependent, but they're not the same. So you could be scanned later and born later. You could be born earlier, but still scanned at a later time. So there's two continuous variables playing into this. And there's only a limited span of these in the data. Like we don't have every single uh, point um, that we wish we could have. We don't have every combination of gestational age, which is in the x-axis, and postmenstrual age at scan, which is at the y-axis. Um, but you know, we have uh, images, we have scans, we have as much as we can, and what we have is 
Um, something to work with. So the DHCP is great in that we have four imaging modalities, but in fact, in this work, I just use myelination and cell depth. But these are surface extracted um, images with um, imaging modalities on them. And they're uh, 625 scans, but they're 580 subjects, which means that some of them are follow-up scans. And we, as I said, uh, extracted surfaces that are very nicely registered to a template and re resample to what are essentially spheres, just to make processing and analysis and modeling easier. And we know mathematically you can you can argue that we don't lose much because um, uh, they are uh, topologically equivalent. A sphere and a brain are the same shape in mathematically. Um, so this is what the, the real meshes look like. This is a nice example of curvature. Um, and this is how we sort of map them onto the icosphere for modeling. Um, so how do we model, um, how do we perform deep modeling uh, on the surface? Well, we use what's known as geometric deep learning, which is a, a sort of um, a subfield of deep learning specialized in trying to adapt existing methods to these weird things. So spherical meshes, for example, could be seen as a graph. They could be seen as a mesh. It could be seen as a manifold or as a, a sphere in a mathematical sense. So these are all different ways of looking at these spherical meshes here. Um, and the principle of GDL, uh, geometric deep learning, is when you have uh, an image that is not nice and flat, in fact, any image, you have to match your convolution to that domain. So if it's a sphere or a graph or a manifold or indeed 2D or 3D, you have to choose um, a convolution that matches that. That's why when you have a 3D image, you typically use 3D convolutions. Um, and this, the mathematical setup of the convolution matches the desired properties that you have. It is optimal to model what you have. So there's a whole long story of geometric deep learning that I won't really go over, but in this particular project, we're using, we're imagining this uh, mesh is a, a bunch of points being connected as if it was a graph. And the convolution is a graph convolution that we use. Um, and well, what do we model? So if you look at this data set, there is two things that we can model, um, which correspond to my two sort of different um, experiments. The first one, which I normal, normal in massive quotation marks. In fact, I should be saying healthy, not normal, but even even the healthy is not true. So normal, quote unquote, cortical development is the sort of subset of our data where the gestational age at birth and the age at scan is about the same. And I have quite a lot of those. Um, so the idea behind that is that immediately after birth, they're scanned. So we haven't had time to, in theory, which isn't true, um, there hasn't been time to witness the effects that, for example, prematurity might have on the developing brain. So this a uh, model in theory should be able to, uh, this generative model should be able to um, uh, generate uh, synthetic images of any uh, PMA, assuming that everything is healthy, assuming that your birth age also increases, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing we can do is try and see the effect of prematurity by taking into account our follow-up scans where you know you might be scanned at the same age of two different subjects scanned at the same age but they're not born the same age so that prematurity has the time to affect what the scan looks like um and the way that we do this is a little difficult uh, because things are continuous so if you're familiar with cycle gan this is quite a nice method where you split two different domains like you know high pma low pma and we train models that just flip between them. And the key thing here is the cycle loss. So you take any image, um, we can generate something, we don't know what it looks like, something that is a higher PMA, and then we have another model that 
takes it back, and our regularizer is the cycle loss. Um, so our problem is that we don't really want that because we, we have everything continuous. I don't want to discretize this space. There isn't, there isn't a reason to do that. In theory, medically, they say 37 weeks is term, but that's that's hand wavy, right? There's no difference between 36.8 and 37.2. These are not two really distinct classes. So I want a continuous version of this process. Uh, one of the ways I we sort of solve this is to randomly choose different points along this uh, time timeline and then try and generate the images for that timeline and regularize it the same way as we did before. So say I want to generate, I have this real image at some age. Um, I've randomly chosen two other ages and I want to generate the images for that. In order to keep things consistent, I always go back to the initial image and I have a cycle loss. So what are the requirements of this process of the images that you generate? They've got to be realistic, but they've got to look the correct age. So the way you did this is, is a little bit clever. It's based on some other um, paper I've seen where the generator actually takes in the age difference. So you give it the age and the age difference and it will learn how to jump the amount that you want it to jump. And we can actually integrate that into the discriminator as well. So say we have this fake image, which is at this fake age, we can train a discriminator to say, yes, this is a correct image when you feed it, confound it on the fake age. And we train it to say, actually, this original age, that's not, that's wrong. This new age, that's the correct one. And of course, we regularize it with the real images where, you know, the real images, at the actual age has to be correctly classified. And if you give it any other fake age, it should be told no. The discriminator say no. This is not an image that is accurate to that age. And well, I said we're going to generate two points and do this cycle, but I could choose only one point, right? So I could say I'm going to flip between one and the other, and this is kind of a cycle GAN. If you think about it, it's like a cycle GAN, but with like a moving sort of destination. And Initially, when I did this, I was kind of a little bit obsessed with trying to justify this weird method and the number of cycles. But it, I, honestly, it's not become really the focus of this project, but it is certainly part of it. Um, so on this changing PMA task where we're doing normal scan age progression, we have quite a nice um, sort of, uh, we, we have to generate really nice images here. Um, qualitatively, they're really good. They seem to match quite well with the desired scan age. That's for myelination. And for sulcal depth, pretty good, um, except maybe at the very lower end. This one, th there's far too many folds here. Like it hasn't really managed to delete the folds as it should. It's struggled a little bit, but it's done okay. And the, the best way to sort of analyze this is with a quantitative uh, uh, analysis. So say I've taken, I've got this new generated image uh, where I've, the target scan age PMA is 34. You know, cool, prove it, prove that, let's, let's, how do we validate that this is, you know, actually worked? So one of the things I did was I have a separate independently trained regressor and I take the regressor and I feed it this image and I say, well, what's the, what does this predict the scan age? And if it tells me that, oh, this is an image that is 34.1, well, you know, I've done, I've done pretty well. But if it tells me, hey, look, you know, this, this looks like a, a 30, an, a 36 week old uh, image, then maybe it's, um, you know, performed a little less well. So that's a really good way of checking the accuracy of the age prediction. Um, so that's what this column here is. There's another sort of set of columns because I've chosen three different ways to do this, but it's really one thing, which is, which is a problem that I sort of saw later on, which is some of the models realize that I can just get rid of the features of the original 
image of the original baby and then just put in like cut and paste just replace your original baby with a baby with um the scan age that you want or at least chunks of it but we want to subject specific we want to retain features of the subject and there are a couple of ways of looking at this you can see for example um in this particular uh sort of progression it's kept this little um sort of artifact there and actually when you look at when you look at um real data real longitudinal data there will be stuff like oh this looks like a little artifact but actually it's a weird weird little bit of myelin that actually did myelinate uh with time and and you can consider just a feature of that baby uh, it's a little bit easier with stuff like sulco depth because this particular pattern is unique if you look at another baby you're not going to get this particular pattern so the fact that it retained this pattern uh, in the in the process of um, generating new images is a very confident indicator that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so that's one way of sort of hand wavingly saying our subjects are still it's still subject specific. We're not cheating. We're not we're not saying oh I'm going to age you know this person and then say it's a picture of Logan and I replace it with a picture of like of you know. Um, David Attenborough and like, oh, well, he's at the 80, I've aged Logan. No, that's not the same guy. Um, so that's like a qualitative way of doing it. But quantitatively, it's nice to sort of prove that we're getting there. So if you take these image similarity measures and we compare them to the original image, we expect a really high correlation. And this is, um, we kind of found that my choice of, uh, cycle length of three is the one where you got good age accuracy, but you were still uh, subject specific. And that's something that we kind of noticed that if you think about it with these uh, long uh, cycles, the the more and more and more and more I generate, uh, the longer the cycle, the more sort of, the more I generate images before I impose a cycle loss the sort of the weaker the cycle loss is if that makes sense um and harder and harder it is to um get back to the same subject so increasing uh n which is the number of cycles seems to have an impact on the uh image um the subject specificity because you're kind of losing something each time so that's our analysis. Honestly, like I said, I was a little bit obsessed with this at the beginning, but it's not really that important to our results, except to say that we validated it and we have a model that gives a very nice accuracy one week when the baseline is 0.6 weeks for the regressor. That's pretty good. And it has uh, optimal uh, subject specificity. That's good enough. Um, and we can map actually the, this is, <laughs> slightly complicated um, um, graph, but what, what you see here is the black dotted line is the regressor and the black line is our model. And here we're, we're, we're saying, we're plotting the input age, so the target age to the predicted age by the regressor. And you can see that in the middle, you know, it's almost perfect, right? It's almost great. Our regressor is well within the error of the um, regressor. Sorry, our model, uh, our model images are generating, uh, uh, are generated at age almost precisely the ages that we want. But you can see that there's a, a little bit of trouble at the higher end, which means that if you take an image, um, say it's 35 weeks, 36 weeks, and you say, I want it to look 43 weeks old, 44, 45, the, the really at the top end, it does start to struggle um, hitting those high notes, uh, generating images at 44, 45 weeks. Um, Adela, it, yeah? can I interrupt at this point? Because it, it just makes me think of something that I, I, there's some questions in the chat which you can deal with at the end, but the first one oh, I, I asked. Even know that there was, sorry. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter because we can deal with them later. But my one was, if you go back to your age distribution for age at scan. Yeah. Oh, dear. 
Yeah. That's age of birth, isn't it? Uh, no, age that's of, that's age everyone. of scan is the y-axis. That's everyone. Go to the next one. All right. Okay. We'll just look at this one. Yeah. So, like, there's obviously, like, uh, I don't. How much data would you lose if you instead created a rule where you don't use any data if the infant was scanned, or especially with the prems, like two weeks after birth. I see what you mean, because um, the average deviation between my assumption that age at birth is equal to age at scan, which is what we mean by normal, is 1.2. But I can see what you mean. I hadn't really thought that there are certainly like quite There's a bit of There's one there that scanned six, six weeks, no, eight weeks yeah, after yeah. birth. So I they're not going, to be, Could they're not be, going to be a good model of normal, are they? And... If you removed those, like, would you still have quite such a strong error at that end? If you, you know I mean, I, I wish, I wish, I wish I could like do the zoom annotation thing. But you I know, know exactly which what I mean. you're There's saying, like... right? Because you're saying that my regression line is matching this line. It's it's doing this, right? So there's like, you know, what is there? Twenty, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like 10, 10 that, there that are really quite far off. Yeah, these these ones, right. You know, that that's a good thought, you know, because this does actually reflect my error line, right? Because there's also a cluster here that, you know, you can struggle to see if if you take a 40-week a here, then, or 42-week, you can't really tell if it was born at 42 or if it's born at 43. If Oh, sorry. If you take a gestational age 42, it could just as well be uh, scanned at 42 as it could be scanned at 44, if you see what I mean. So there is an ambiguity at around this higher end uh, here, this end, this 42 to 44, and there is ambiguity here. And that is exactly the point where my model starts to um, sort of mess up here this I is mean at the end of the day you can just say you can use that to explain it but I mean I wonder you'd have to have like a sensible rule but if you're trying to model normal development then see, yeah. including parent preterm data sets that are scanned eight weeks after they're born they're not normals yeah so I see what they're you not mean. I mean, even even including their first scan is like stretching a bit for modeling normal but uh, stretching a lot probably Logan's probably stacking they're going like they're not normals but I don't I don't know I mean that's a good point I might I might run it again but filter out images where the the, the scan age is too far the 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 scan the, the scan age is too far away from birth because this does actually explain this quite well and yeah well I mean for the older age you know they're still supposedly developing normally but uh, I don't know you'd be it's in danger of sort yeah. of hacking it but at least if you do it that way I, then you can explain mm -hmm. you can keep them all in but then explain the findings yeah. in the paper I don't know yeah um, um, and, uh, yeah but my definition normal is GA is equal to PMA so actually this is the, the, that would explain this slight deviation as well. That's actually, I can't believe I didn't think of it. I actually did think of it for this, but I didn't actually think of it for this. I think this is a good point. Uh, thank you, Emma. Anyway, um, so the really interesting part is when, what, anyway, so assume I'm amazing and we've got this model and it's, we ignore this bit. Um, well, even with this, um, let's say we have our model. One of the things that's quite interesting, um, which was so exciting that that's why I stopped caring about the validating the N stuff, is that if we take our initial sort of set that um, Emma was just talking about that we've trained our model on, well, we can take a subject that is a uh, low uh, scan age, and then we can model its quote unquote healthy normal development but then we could take one of its follow-up scans and see how far is, like, what is the difference between the follow-up scan and the quote-unquote normal? And here's a nice sort of example. Ignore the black dots, please, because it's um, just an artifact of the rendering. I think I've, I've actually shown this before. But um, if we look at this particular image, what we have here is a normal 
uh, the, the original subject. It's a premature um, subject. It's exactly what I've demonstrated here. And these are the quote unquote normal development um, images that we generated uh, for specific scan ages. But we actually have a follow up scan. We have the follow up scan, this one, and this is what it looks like. And we can actually take a look at the similarity between this follow up scan and the expected normal scan. And then that's our measure of is something funny going on here? How far away is this image from where it should be? So if we take that as a measure and we plot it against QChat scores, where QChat scores are the higher they are, the more um, it's a it's a it's a it's a self-reported questionnaire sort of measure of autism risk. We actually find correlation. Um, it's not perfect correlation. There are um, there are outliers, and even the way I've sort of set up the image similarity metric is, uh, varies for subject to subject, which is probably why it's not as crisp as it should be. But nonetheless, we get a coefficient of correlation of 0 0.3, which I, I guess in the, the great Matty world, that's not great. But in our world, that's actually pretty good. And it's better than a lot of our previous attempts, and it's better than some uh, sort of more published attempts, which managed to get 0.2. So this is kind of exciting. We have a, a common sense idea behind something that could be a measure of risk of autism. Now, it, it needs work, but I, th this is quite a nice result um, and something that I think uh, definitely will, will be um, investigating more of. So that's quite nice. And it kind of does make sense as a use to, for this model that can develop that we can, um, uh, you know, identify um, deviation from healthy quote unquote development. And on birth age, we've done the same thing. So um, we've taken images and we changed the birth age and we're trying to get a target birth age to match a predicted birth age. In this case, it's a little bit more difficult because Birth age is just a, a harder task. It's harder even to predict it. Our, our prediction, our regressor is actually, um, regressor accuracy is like 1.5 or something, um, which is pretty bad. Um, but we can see here that we, we still have a correlation. We still seem to be getting at least to a good degree a model that can change birth age of, a, of an image, which is very interesting. This is what we want because we want to see what are the effects of prematurity. Um, and so these are some images so of where uh, birth age is being decreased along the um, x-axis. And it's quite hard to interpret. That's why we have difference maps. And the really the takeaway thing here is as birth age decreases, we just see a heck of a lot more blue. There's just less myelination going on. Um, and that's what we expect in the literature, particularly around this region, temporal lobe. You get quite a lot of um, decrease in myelination. And that's and that's what we expect. And it's quite it's quite reassuring that we get the same sort of patterns that are already known to exist in in um, in in when when looking at the effect of prematurity, uh, on on sulk depth it's a little bit more. Hang on, can we weird? go back to the myelin? Isn't they yeah. saying that like some areas, some areas that are heavily myelinated have more myelin? Yeah, it's a little bit weird, but I think um, I think what I uh, so this is um, so yeah. I think it says that there's more myelin at certain regions if you're premature, which doesn't really make sense. It might be like an artifact thing, but I mean, it could not be. So I don't know the literature on it, but it doesn't, it doesn't see, I'll have to look at other subjects to see if there's any consistency in where this myelination is being predicted. We can always average the difference. That's just through oh, yeah. sort of one average pattern, but there seems to be like a lot of areas where it's increased relativity. Yeah. It's only these spots because if you look at the oh, Logan's, Logan's here. 
makes sense, right? What? Like if you're if you're in your ex vitro environment earlier, maybe that is like driving myelination because you're adapting to something that you shouldn't be otherwise in. Uh, because of the what? Sorry, I have to put the volume up. I didn't. So like, if if you're born earlier, right, you're doing things like moving and seeing that you wouldn't otherwise be doing if you were in the womb. So oh. that env that environmental stimulus might be driving myelination if you were born earlier. Mm. Man, you're so smart. That I hadn't even thought of that. That's so okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll check. Um, I'll check. Uh. The, the maps, I haven't looked at them in a while, the uh, difference maps that exist in the literature. I don't remember there being much on increased myelination, though, but I will take a look. That's a good point. That's a main, yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. So I'll check that. Um, I did check for sulcal depth because it's more complex. And on sulcal depth, uh, okay, this is the only thing that I found in the literature that is comparing changes in sulcal depth with preterm and uh, I guess in, in, in my case uh, red is blue and blue is red but I, I honestly I, I was just going to ask you I don't really understand what they're referring to here I don't know what this they, they're talking mainly on sulci and they've said that the 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 regions that are um, covered in the black line are statistically significant so for them, the sulcal depth is mostly around this region and this sulci, which I haven't seen in our data. I'm not sure what sulcus this is. So um, I'm having a bit of trouble interpreting this, but I do know that one of the things that is interesting is that the temporal lobe is the last one to differentiate and is very sensitive to um, changes. And, and it's highlighted quite strongly here. And also that it seems to be a bit like curvature follows um, the sulci, it does seem to follow a little bit patterns of the sulci, but I, I, I'm not confident in my in the wording of my conclusions here because I'm not confident in interpreting the existing literature on, on, on changes in sulci depth. I have looked, and this is the only one on it, and it doesn't um, sort of add any clarity to this. But, yeah. Although we do, we do kind of have... Um, some changes here yeah yeah and that's um that's kind of that that's it i didn't add an end slide uh but i think i have a whole bunch of questions that i didn't know about uh that i just thought blah, blah, blah. how do you do if a fake age is not in your data set um but that's it like i i don't if i don't have the fake if I don't have the fake age, I don't have the fake age. But because I in, input it as a as a float, literally as just a number and as an age difference, I think the the, the model has learned that that you know that there's a linear sort of changing in in the you know it will learn that it's going to be somewhere between the the existing values. Bear in mind, I have very specific PMAs and I choose very random. Um, PMAs later. So there's a, a whole, like almost every single to one decimal place, almost every single age difference is being attempted and generated. I mean, it's a little bit like asking, how does the regressor know if you don't have a sample? If you only have 33, uh, uh, PMA 33.1 and PMA 33.3, how does it predict 33.2? I think uh, it's, it's a little bit like that. I don't have it, but I just I just put it in and I put the age difference in and assume that the linearity of the of the of the process will, will, will provide um, some regularization. Oh, wait, other questions. Yeah, can you go, go back to the second guy? I, I... Yeah. Oh, that's not the cycle again. Yeah. The one with the oh, this one. Yeah, sorry, sorry, this recycle, yeah. Like, how do you measure? Like, what happens in the middle? Like, how do you measure that it's doing what you you want it to do? Like, like in the first step and the second step. Like, how do we know it's actually doing your fake age? Do you have like a loss there that measures something? 
Yeah, yeah. So th these are the two losses, right? It's based on the discriminator. So we have a generator loss that it is correctly. This is the generator loss that this is correctly of this fake age, and this is the discriminator loss that this is of this age and this is not. So the discriminator is trying to say that this is a lie, right? It's trying to detect that this is a fake. Okay, so this loss is at okay after each one of the. Yes. So for each point, this would have its own loss. And you said at some point that you had like, for instance, for three terms that were like you have follow up for some of them. Um, yes. Couldn't you like use some of the follow up scans? Like, I don't know, let's say like you start from 26 weeks and then you sample, I don't know, 38 and it appears that it's the age of a follow up scan for that baby. Couldn't you use this actual like follow up scan to compute like sort of like a difference with your generated uh, scan at 38 and like to make sure that it's actually reconstructing the good things. I don't know, like add this extra information that you have some follow ups in the training, if you see what I mean. Oh, uh, you want to use the follow ups to regularize the. Yes, exactly. Yes. That's an interesting thought. I, I kept the follow ups away so that I could focus like you can already see the effect that um, including the slightly not follow ups has sort of ruined my um, my model. I don't know how I would do that, to be honest. Let me think. I mean, you, you might not have enough examples because it would be possible only for the pretense anyway. But, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. thanks. And, the, and to, to Emma's question about without added input, there is one very important um, thing that I didn't mention, um, and I did this to make sure. So when I do my generation generating a new image, I don't generate an image, I generate a difference map and I add it to the starting image. And that is a huge, huge part of the reason that I'm not generating junk because and I'm keeping the subject specificity and stuff. If you try and generate just a new image, it, it struggles quite a bit with the task, um, especially with the, the, the amount of data we have without pre-training. So if I, um, so you can see like it generates good images, but the subject specificity is bad because it's not generating a difference map, it's generating a new image. And that's very, very easy to just do the thing that I said of replacing my subject at 26 weeks with another subject at 38 weeks. But in in, in practical terms, we learn difference maps, so it's very hard to cheat. Um, it's very hard to do that sort of cheating and, and lose the subject specificity um, with, with that. So that's why without adding input is is tested as kind of a validation of our, our method as well. I'm trying to, oh wait, are there more questions? Do you try any other behavioral measures? Yeah, they, they, I tried and I didn't really get too much correlation with the other ones. Then I mapped QChat and I mapped QChat with, I mapped the, me, the actual behavioral measures together and I didn't, I got like a correlation of zero. So, and I vaguely remember they said that QChat is better than Bailey's. So maybe I cherry picked, but I, I didn't get much of Bailey's and I really didn't get maybe much. Maybe you need to take out different parts of Bailey's. Yeah, I wouldn't, some ins, uh, yeah, if I, if you got ideas on, on that, that'd be helpful. I mean, because oh, just because I don't have that much knowledge of the actual, uh, cognitive outcome measures. The Baileys wasn't, was, was I, like I said, I, I mapped, I ended up tr just trying to find correlation between the different measures themselves and I got almost nothing, which is um, an issue. I thought the, um, the eye tracking, I think we had like an eye tracking or something. There was like a new one and I was using that, but then uh, I was told that they, they, they're not finished or they're not accurate. Subcategories of the babies. Oh, like um, classify them, like uh, discretize them. <laughs> Language or motor. Oh, I don't know if I have that data actually. Hi there. My name is Mohammed. I'm here on behalf of Eating Council to share some information regarding food erosion cycling and general cycling. Um, oh. 
Oh, was that person in real life? Oh, so you joined the um. Okay, the language scores. Okay, okay, please, please send, please send. Abdullah, you, you use Monet for the for the network, right? No, it says the graph convolution. I used I actually use Monet for the regressor because um, I wanted it not to look like the same as the the generator because if the generator is learning based on a bunch of features and your regressor that is judging it is using the same features. Okay. Um, by regressor, I mean like just the this one, yeah. the the one the one the one to validate, not the one in the discriminator. Why did you use like graph methods? Like, I mean, they're like, like, have you tried the spherical unit or like, I don't know. I just found it worked better. Although it kind of does, it has one huge problem, which is um, because it's not very expressive. Like you get patchy dotty graph artifacts, um, but it just worked a lot better. And I don't know why. And it wasn't Chebinet or anything. It was the graph conf. It was um, a spatial graph convolution. So I guess spatial graph convolution is just a slightly more expressive moment, um, which is yeah, without the um, without the rotational equivariance. So I guess in this task, everything in template space. I don't care about rotations. Um, it worked out better with the. With, with the more expressive uh, convolution on, on the graphs. Did Mariana have her question answered? Sorry, I had someone come to oh, the Sorry, board. I was, uh, Mariana, did I, did I, was I so rude? But I just got yeah, no, up. sorry, I just had my hand up. because I, oh, like, I can't even see oh, these. Like, really type, what? Yeah, sorry, I just can't, yeah, you know what, maybe it's because, uh, no, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, just like about like when you're doing like the um, um, the uh, sorry, the subject specificity metric stuff. Like, are you just comparing like because I kind of having the same issues like with my bank stuff about like how to like evaluate like what's the best like yeah exactly kind of the same thing as you like what is the best like um like combination of like being uh, accurate at like predicting the age, but also being like looking like the real brain, like of the specific subject. Um, but like when you're doing that, are you just comparing it to like, so you have like your original image of a certain age and are you just comparing like that image to like your generated ones or are you using the follow up? Yes, no, no, that's it, which is. But then, uh, and then like, are you like somehow like, there's Taking a lot of reasons so that doesn't work. So I could have the best subject specificity by not doing anything, right? And it could vary based on the data. Point. Yeah, I exactly. Because it's like kind of silly way. Yeah, go on. Go. Yeah, yeah. Because it's kind of like what, like the question that I have with mine is like, I think I was even discussing this with Emma the other day. It's like, I know, like, if I'm, like, are you somehow like taking into account the fact that like the larger the time span that you are like predicting like the larger like if you have a baby that's originally like 20 yeah, I don't know if this is a normal year <laughs> 20 <laughs> weeks and like you're predicting it at 40 then it should look more different than if you have one at 20 and you're predicting at like 25 does that make sense so I didn't and I kind of worked out that it almost didn't matter because because of the particular reason that I'm using this is just to compare across models Mm -hmm. So that would be the same. That same would be true for every single one of these. So overall, this is a measure of similarity. See what I mean? But in a, to understand, to, to it, you see what I'm trying to say? So you're right that this is a really nonsense way of looking at image similarity. Because one, I could have a model that doesn't do anything and it's perfect. Two, I haven't taken into account exactly like you said, um, a large jump, it should look completely different almost. Um, in this particular case, because I'm looking at relative performance, it's fine because if this overall 
I'm looking at every single subject. I'm looking at the same subjects, the same age changes, the same this, the same that. This is is indicating that this model is better in specificity than this model. That works. But if I wanted to give this result standalone, it's nonsense, right? It's like I'm trying to imply that the the best thing to get is was 100 or 1.0. Well, that's not true because I'm trying to change the image. Like it doesn't make sense. And I really struggled with this. I there wasn't there wasn't an answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of the same thing for me. Uh, yeah, but then did you try to use the like follow up scans and like compare your I think Simo already has this. So I, I tried that and then you get the other you get again more nonsense because then you're saying what am I really measuring here? Co similarity to the follow up scan, but the follow up scan again, I don't know how far it's like, I don't know how far ahead the follow up scan is. Then it depends on the prematurity. Um, I I literally measured both of them and I got similar results. Mm -hmm. So I did similarity for both the follow up and the original. Um, I can't remember why I was less inclined for the follow up. Um, you know, okay, it's just like, how do you? Yeah, again, because this is like just exactly like the same thing that I like am currently trying to do, but like with the Annie stuff, uh, with the biobank stuff, like. How do you know that like this? So, for example, like you have like this for like. If you have like a cycle length of like four, and you have like an age accuracy of like 0 0.8, like. How do you? And then like you have like this similarity that's like less, but then how do you know that like that's not actually like? That's not because it's a better model. So you're trying to say maybe I have a smaller similarity because I've aged it more and your other the other model with the high similarity didn't age it enough and it's just not that good. Or maybe the real the real reality is, you know, maybe there are changes that I haven't taken into account. And I'm just too stiff, basically. My model isn't good enough, but it's pretending it's good enough with the high uh, structural similarity. I don't know. Um, I had a yeah, lot. Yeah, have you tried to like calculate like? So for the ones that you have the subject, like, have you tried to calculate like what is like these metrics that you get if you compare just the follow up to the original, like just real images? I have, yeah. So I get, I get, I get similar sort of scale of results mm, yeah 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 okay um yeah I, I had a real struggle with this i just didn't like there are a million things wrong with this measure so yeah as and you're pointing out all of them one by one <laughs> sorry that's it's it's just, not to criticize true. your work is this because i'm it's like true. literally you're, trying you're to right, do the same thing right. <laughs> like uh, i've been thinking about so the reason that i went through the pain of structural similarity metric is because it's more it, it more captures the kind of idea of does this look similar to this? And this is a, a real pain to code up, especially in the surface. So you're you're in 3D, right? So you can just psychic learn or whatever and you run it. But for me, I coded it myself and it takes like 10 minutes per subject or something. But um, I had to use that to at least not look like an idiot. Um, there isn't an answer, but. <laughs> 